শুভ সন্ধ্যা বিস্তার চিটাগং আর্টস কমপ্লেক্স আয়োজিত চলচ্চিত্র বিষয়ক সাপ্তাহিক অনুষ্ঠান বিক্ষণ ও বাহাসের ছেচল্লিশ তম পর্বে আপনাদের স্বাগত জানাই আমাদের এই পর্বের অতিথি আমাদের সবারই অত্যন্ত প্রিয় এবং পরিচিত মুখ চলচ্চিত্র নির্মাতা এবং শিক্ষক ক্যাথরিন মাসুদ ক্যাথরিন মাসুদ মূলত মুক্তির গান ছবিটির জন্যই আমাদের কাছে এতটা পরিচিত এবং জনপ্রিয় পাশাপাশি অবশ্যই সমকালীন আধুনিক বাংলাদেশি চলচ্চিত্রের একজন প্রধান কুশীলক প্রয়াত তারেক মাসুদের সহধর্মিনী হিসেবে সহধর্মিনীর কথাটি এই ক্ষেত্রে আমি অন্তত একেবারে আক্ষরিক করতেই ব্যবহার করছি অর্থাৎ তারেক যা কিছু করত করেছে তার সবটুকুতে ছিল ক্যাথরিন এর পূর্ণাঙ্গ অংশগ্রহণ অর্থাৎ তারেকের চলচ্চিত্র বলতে আলাদা করে আমি তারেকের চলচ্চিত্র হিসেবে দেখি না আমি মনে করি তারেক এবং ক্যাথরিন দুজনে মিলেই তাদের সমস্ত কাজ করেছে বিশেষ করে নেপথ্যের কাজগুলো কঠিন কাজগুলো অপ্রিয় কাজগুলো হাসি মুখে সম্পাদন করেছে ক্যাথরিন প্রযোজনা অর্থায়ন প্রচার প্রচারণা যোগাযোগ তো আছে এই আরেকটি বিশেষ কাজ তারেক মাসুদের খানিকটা প্রযুক্তি ভীতি বা অনিহা ছিল সেগুলো সব সামলাত ক্যাথরিন নিজে সে সাংঘাতিক দক্ষ যন্ত্রপাতি ইত্যাদিতে এবং সে সম্পাদনার কাজও খুবই দক্ষ মূল সম্পাদনের কাজ খুবই ক্যাথরিনই করেছে এর বাইরে চিত্রনাট্য লেখার কাজ অর্থাৎ সব মিলিয়ে ক্যাথরিন এবং তারেকের প্রযোজনা হিসেবেই আমি এই কাজগুলোকে দেখে থাকি তো আজকে আমরা তেমনি একজন একেবারেই খুব অভিজ্ঞ এবং খুব কুশলী চলচ্চিত্র নির্মাতা এবং শিক্ষক ক্যাথরিন মাসুদের জীবনের গল্প শুনব শিক্ষক এই অর্থে যে ক্যাথরিন কিন্তু চলচ্চিত্র নিয়ে প্রচুর বক্তৃতা দেওয়া ক্লাস নেওয়া কোর্স করা শিক্ষকতা বাংলাদেশেও করেছে এখন তো এটা তার পেশায় আমি সে পেশায় আসছি তার আগে আমি ছোট্ট করে একটা পরিচয় দিয়ে রাখতে চাই ক্যাথরিন তো জন্মসূত্রে মার্কিন নাগরিক যদিও বাংলাদেশের সঙ্গে তার একেবারে আত্মিক যোগাযোগ যতটা না সে বাড়কে তার চেয়ে বেশি সম্ভবত বাঙালি বাংলাদেশি সে পড়াশোনা করেছে যুক্তরাষ্ট্রের একটি অত্যন্ত মর্যাদাপূর্ণ বিশ্ববিদ্যালয় রোড আইল্যান্ড রাজ্যের ব্রাউন ইউনিভার্সিটিতে এবং তার বিষয়টি ছিল ডেভেলপমেন্ট স্টাডিজ সম্ভবত সেই কারণেই সেই সূত্রেই তার বাংলাদেশি আগমন এটা আমরা শুনবো তার মুখ থেকে একটু পরেই এবং তার এই পড়াশোনা চলাকালীন এক বছর সে ফ্রান্সেও কাটিয়েছিল ইউনিভার্সিটি অফ লিমোতে সে ছিল এক্সচেঞ্জ স্টুডেন্ট হিসেবে পরবর্তীকালে বার্মন কলেজ অফ আর্টস থেকে ফাইন আর্টস থেকে সে চলচ্চিত্র নিয়েও স্নাতকোত্তর পড়াশোনা করেছে এবং সেখান থেকে সনদ নিয়েছে সে তো আজকে আমরা ক্যাথরিনের সেই সব অভিজ্ঞতার কথাই শুনব মূলত বাংলাদেশ পর্বটার কথাই শুনবো এরপরে আমরা যাব তার মার্কিন পর্বের কথাও সে এখন এই মুহূর্তে ইউনিভার্সিটি অফ কানেকটিকার সে যেখানে থাকে তার কাছে একটি বিশ্ববিদ্যালয় ইউনিভার্সিটি অফ কানেকটিকার শিক্ষকের অনেক ধরনের কোর্স সে নিজেই সে উদ্ভাবন করেছে এবং এর আগে দু হাজার তেরোতে সে সেখানকার কাছাকাছি আরেকটি বিশ্ববিদ্যালয় আমহার্স কলেজ খুব বিখ্যাত আমহার্স কলেজ সেখানকার সে আর্টিস্ট রেসিডেন্স ছিল পরবর্তী একটি বছর এক সেমিস্টার সে সেখানে কুড়ি বছর সে আর বাংলাদেশে তো তার প্রচুর অভিজ্ঞতা রয়েছে পড়ানো আমাদের যে সিনেমা অ্যান্ড টেলিফিল ইনস্টিটিউট সেখানে নর্থ সাউথ বিশ্ববিদ্যালয়ে নিমকো ন্যাশনাল ইনস্টিটিউট অফ মাস কমিউনিকেশন পাঠশালা সাউথ এশিয়ান ইনস্টিটিউট অফ মিডিয়া সব জায়গাতেই তার কাজ রয়েছে লেখালেখি করেছে প্রচুর গবেষণা করেছে সম্পাদনা মানে ক্যাথরিন এক কথা একজন কর্মবীর সে কাজ ছাড়া কিছু বোঝে না একেবারে কাজের নেশা তার আর কি এখন অনেক রকম কাজ করছে আর কি তো আমরা সেই কথা শুনবো তবে শুরুতে আমি আমার প্রয়াত বন্ধু তারেক মাসুদ যার দশম মৃত্যুবার্ষিকী এই এক সপ্তাহ আগে আমরা অতিক্রম করে গেলাম তেরো তারিখ তারেক মাসুদ এবং তার সঙ্গে একই সঙ্গে মিশুক মনির আমাদের আরেক বন্ধু চলচ্চিত্র গ্রাহক এবং তাদের আরো কয়েকজন সহযাত্রী সহযোগী আমাদের কাছে বিদায় নিয়েছেন সে দু হাজার এগারোতে একটি মর্মান্তিক দুর্ঘটনায় আমি তাদের সবার প্রতি আমার শ্রদ্ধা এবং ভালোবাসা ব্যক্ত করে আজকের অনুষ্ঠান এখানে শুরু করছি 
निश्चित मिसे अनुष्ठान इंग्रेजी कथा सब मिले दिभाषिक अनुष्ठान अपनारा से एक मेने नीबें और सबशेषे यथारीति एक मुक्त आलोचना आयोजन रेखे अपनारा जरा जूमे आसबें जरा लाइव देखें ता जी तरह संगे जो करते चान सरसि लिखे हमें से सूझकटी रखब पर एक मुक्त आलोचना आयोजन करब और तो यही सूचना बक्तव्य शेष करी कैथरिन के आनुष्ठानिक भाव आमंत्रण जाना आज के आंतर्जा मंचे वेलकाम टू विस्तार अनल स्टेज कैथरिन थैंक यू आलम आलम तो प्रथम बोलते चाहिए दर्शक मंडल क्षमा चाची कारण आज के मत तो बाध्य बसिवरे इंग्रेजी बोलते हैं कारण बांगल् दुरबल हो गए हाँ एक कारण कारण करणार कारण गत दु बचरे बांगलेशे जावा अथच ए बचर आलम जी तो दशम मृत्युबासी पार हो गए घनी बंधु मिशुक हारिए मिशुक के तरह तीन जन चलचित्रकर्मी जरा छो से दिन से मार्मान्तिक दिन तर चले ग तो तक स्मरण करी और आसलेस खुब भलो लगत तब यह प्रोग्रामर माध्यम मन हम अपने मजे आनंद लगती लगते एखने थकते दिनगुली चेस्टाइडेशन <laughs> Uh well I um I grew up in Chicago uh in the Midwest in the United States um and uh on the south side which is a very tough part of the city um and I went you know through the public schools there and uh um my mother didn't want us to feel any sense of privilege although my background is somewhat privileged I came, I come from a family of politicians and explorers um Uh, my great grandfather Hiram Bingham was the scientific discoverer of Machu Picchu of the Incan civilization in South America and he was a senator and anyway there are various prominent people in the past in the family but uh, you know we had very ordinary kind of upbringing um and uh, then I went on uh, as Ala mentioned to study uh, development economics at Brown University Um my father was a professor of philosophy and uh he passed away a few years ago. My mother is a family therapist. I have a brother also who is a professor of theoretical physics, so I guess it's not surprising that um after everything I've ended up being a professor myself. Um so uh when I got to um college I Uh, became very interested in Latin America particularly I traveled um several times to 
Latin America to Mexico and Guatemala, El Salvador. Uh, this is during the time of the Civil War in that region. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I read that during your senior years in your study, you have done some research on Guatemala, human rights uh, abuse and activism yes, in Guatemala, right? Senior... Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Yes, my senior dissertation, uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, because I chose a very special major, actually, uh, I was an interdisciplinary major, so I had to write a uh, senior thesis, and the topic was human rights, um, the indigenous people's movement for human rights in Guatemala. So um, I think that's sort of where my interest in, you know, um, uh, global, um, politics, international politics, and human rights began during that time. But at the same time, I, I also had a background in the fine arts. I had um, studied painting and originally had gone to college to be a fine arts major. But uh, that sort of got derailed with my other growing interests in the world and, um, and human rights. Um, but I did, as Allah mentioned, I spent um, a year in France as part of my studies. And during that time, I started to watch a lot of films because I was in a town called Lyon and there were many very small film theaters, sort of, you know, like film clubs around the city. And I used to just wander in, um, uh, you know, on any particular night to see what was playing. And in that way, I saw a lot of classic cinema, um, you know, uh, of the French New Wave and, you know, the Italian neorealists and um, and it just got me very interested in cinema and uh, I wasn't really thinking of making films, but I was interested in the whole sort of creative process behind it, having had a kind of training in, you know, visual media uh, and visual arts. Uh, but again, that kind of went on the back burner, I would say, um, for some time. All right. Yeah. Actually, I was, you know, going to ask you that uh, when and how your interest in cinema actually began to take root in your mind. So I got some clue, uh, but I'd like to hear more about it later. Uh, but we'll uh, switch to Bangladesh phase, you know. Uh, I can very well understand and guess that it, your study in um, development economics may be a link uh, with Bangladesh, but which actually triggered your trip, actual physical trip to Bangladesh? Uh, do you remember, you know? And um, how did you actually end up meeting your future soulmate, our dear friend Tarek Masood in Bangladesh, if you can, you know, share that whole phase of your life? Well, a lot of things that we can actually, in hindsight, seem like a straight path, but actually many things happen just as a matter of chance. Kaktalio Babe. Wow, <laughs> what a lovely word. <laughs> <laughs> I like that word. I like that word. Uh -huh. um, so uh, actually, I didn't really know much about Bangladesh. You know, I didn't mm -hmm. really study Bangladesh as part of my studies in, in development uh, economics. Um, my focus, as I said, was Latin America. But I had a professor who was my thesis advisor. And um, during the time that I was at Brown, I had uh, founded um, a chapter of a national student organization called the Overseas Development Network. Um, that um, raised awareness about uh, developing countries and their issues on campuses across the country. Um, and, you know, there was, uh, there was a certain amount of activism involved, and I actually organized a whole seminar on Sub-Saharan sub uh, sub Africa and the crisis in the Sahel. And, um, and so... It was through that organization that I applied for an overseas internship with an NGO. But I actually wrote to many different countries um, and organizations that we had contacts for through this uh, student organization. And I think there were a couple of it, it, them in Latin America. Of course, I spoke Spanish, so I thought that might be interesting. Uh, then there was a, a, an opportunity in Zimbabwe. And then um, I uh, had an interesting contact in Bangladesh. Um, actually, a few contacts there. Um, so I got the most interesting response from Bangladesh. 
And I went to my professor and I said, uh, Professor Whiting, you know, what do you think I should do? Um, uh, because I'm interested in Latin America, but, you know, I've gotten this very interesting response for an internship from Bangladesh. And he just looked through my papers and it was maybe a 10 minute meeting. And he said, you know, I think that this Bangladesh opportunity sounds like it's very interesting for you, you know. And I wanted to be in a situation where I have a certain amount of freedom, you know, to design my own course of work. And I wanted to do independent research also. And, uh, you know, he was strongly uh, encouraging me to take up that possibility. Mm -hmm. And um, and so that was how my decision was made to go to Bangladesh. And then, of course, before I went, mm -hmm. I started to study Bangla. I read a lot of books about, mm -hmm. you know, the history of uh, the region. Uh, and I also found out some interesting family connections, I should mention. Uh, two in particular. Um, one, and you will like this, Alam. I think you know <laughs> this story. So uh, my grandfather, um, after he graduated from law school from Yale in uh, the early 1930s, he went on a world tour and he was also writing for some different newspapers in the United States as he was traveling. And that tour took him through um, Europe, of course, first and foremost, and he met Mussolini, you know, he traveled to Russia. Uh, met some, you know, major leaders there. He was very interested, actually, in he in mm. in the Soviet Union, and his politics were quite far to the left. Anyway, then he traveled down to Asia, and mm -hmm. um, he was, you know, very excited about the independence movement that was gaining strength there. Um, and um, and he met Nehru, um, and then he traveled to Bengal, and he met. Uh, Rabindranath Tagore uh, oh at Shanti Nikitin. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yes. Is there a written record of that? That meeting? Uh, yes, well, he, or a letter or yes there is a journal. There's mm -hmm. a journal which is kept at the Yale University Library about that whole trip. Um, oh. So, <laughs> so, uh, so I only found that out later. And the other connection is that his brother, Jonathan mm -hmm. Bingham, who had that, uh, who at the time that I left for Bangladesh, um, I think he had retired, but he was a longtime congressman from um, from New York mm -hmm. and uh, a, a, a U.S. representative. And during the 1970 war, he was one of the key signatories to um, a bill um, proposing that the U.S. end all military support for Pakistan in protests uh, against what was being done in the then East Pakistan. So he and Senator Ted Kennedy and, and a core group of um, liberal, you know, uh, Democrats uh, in both the Senate and in, in the House of Representatives uh, proposed this bill. And it was a, a key piece of legislation, you know, that um, that helped to change the tide of public sentiment, uh, particularly amongst elected representatives about the war. Uh, because by the time it was becoming clear uh, mm. what was going on with the flood of refugees mm. in mm. West Bengal. So I didn't know that either <laughs> at the time, um, but uh, that I made that split second decision to go to Bangladesh. But then I found that there were these very interesting connections. Mm. Um, so but anyway, you got some response from Bangladesh, you said any particular organization or individual? Uh, do you remember those? Yeah, well, um, it was a, a there were a couple of small NGOs. I was interested in working for a smaller NGO, not a okay. big national no, this, NGO. Okay, multinational. I actually multi had some colleagues in mm. the organization who also went to Bangladesh with me, and they ended up working, all of them, there were four of them, they all went to work for Proshika. All right, a um, big one. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a big one. Um, and, uh, and they were in Camilla, mainly. But I was in Dhaka, and I was working for a very small organization called RIC, the Resource Integration Center, and later worked for another organization called the Center for Development Study Studies, both mm -hmm. small NGOs okay. Um, okay. and a really kind of support NGOs for even smaller village based NGOs mm -hmm. um, around the country. Um, and for me, that was a, a perfect setting, you know, in which to learn Bangla, first of all, right. and um, mm -hmm. also to get a sense of what was what was happening locally in uh, the field of development, which, you know, was 
I mean, quite narrow in focus. I mean, primarily it was focusing on um, family planning because that's where the money was coming from. Um, and I had I had a very critical perspective on on in terms of family NGO planning. Led development. And, I mean, um, I would say I was quite you know uh, left in my politics, and uh, I I had a very cynical view of the actual development that was taking place. I should and I, I could see um, that protest and rebellion is in your gene. You know, you have inherited this from your grandfathers and uncle, and <laughs> so it's not and, surprising. Uh, uh, yes. family, so, yeah. so it was a very eye-opening experience and actually this organization RIC later shut down was shut mm. down mm -hmm. it was very controversial because the executive committee contained uh was made up mostly of members of Jashod all right uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. and okay. Uh, it was through the you know people who were uh, uh, became my friends who were on that executive committee that I was introduced to a lot of people in leftist political parties, mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. so not only Joshua, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Workers' Party and uh, the mm -hmm. Communist Party, Bangladesh, CPB. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, no, no, it, was... it was a common phenomenon, actually, after the 75 and you know, the killing of Bangabundu and this, you know, turnover of our politics, a lot of, you know, progressive uh, workers and left-leaning uh, activists actually joined in many NGOs, you know, for their survival yes. also. Mm -hmm. For survival purposes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the same, I mean, there were, so I, I got a very um, quick introduction to the, the political uh, situation in Bangladesh. It was during the Ershad's time. And um, as it was a very volatile time uh, with a lot of, you know, hard dolls, of course, since then we've seen many more volatile times in Bangladesh. Um, but I was very curious. I asked a lot of questions, you know, I wanted to understand what was going on. So um, there were many people I met. I remember going to the CPB office and um, and by that time they were starting to split, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. 89, and the, the, the fallout yeah, of Perestreka, Glasnost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. 89 was the beginning of 89. So, uh, AJ in internal Maramari CBB Mubde, um, mm -hmm. and on the left party of Mubde. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I remember uh, they all thought I was a CIA agent. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was only natural, though. And they weren't the only ones, though. There are yeah, many other people uh, like, okay. why did uh -huh. she ask so many questions? You know, mm -hmm. she must be, why did she learn Bangla so fast? <laughs> like, so, um, so, Tarek didn't come into scene yet. As of yet, then, huh? Now, I'm in fact, Bangladesh, I'm egg butcher chillam, Tare Krishna te poricho haorage. All right, okay, so you're talking about that period. So, by the time I met Tarek, already I had been exposed to sort of many different facets of Bangladesh history and politics. And actually, I think the, you know, the person who was instrumental later in that first year period in introducing me to the arts, the cultural scene was uh, um, the poet Ahmed Sofa, and you know that story also a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. But uh, yes, mm. I was introduced to Sofa by through um, one of my Jashod friends. Um, uh, her name was uh, um, Rosie, and she actually taught mathematics at Dhaka College. And um, and so she introduced me to Sofa by, and Sofa by also first dismissed me. He thought I was a... Um, you know, you know, just a uh, stupid white, American. white romantic. Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, stupid American. <laughs> um, but uh, he was something of a romantic himself, I'll have to say. Anyway, so, uh, <laughs> but uh, then I, I guess it, uh, we met a second time in Kolkata uh, by chance, and uh, we had a conversation about Tolstoy because uh, I had recently read War and Peace. And then he decided maybe I, I knew a little uh, a few things about literature. And so he um, decided that, you know, he, he wanted to have me for tea uh, when I got back to Dhaka. And um, he lived uh, uh, in Farmgate at that time at 2 Indira Road. Indira Road, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Indira Road, yeah. Ektala ekta purono bhanga chora bari. Jeta bolo hoto, people called it the Paglaghor. Right, because uh, it was actually owned by a former uh, minister uh, from Sheikh Mujib's time, Bangabundu's uh, government uh, time. Yeah, uh, Mr. Mufis Choudhury, I guess. So. Uh, yes, 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 Dr. Yes. Mufis Choudhury. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. he actually, you know, director Borobari Chilogulchane, but she Palayashto farm gate, Darpadbaghore, Okane, Bibino, 
you know, Shilpi Shomaj take a Bibino kind of Kwasha Moto Gurizito, people from various, uh, you know, walks of life and literature mm. and mm. music and the fine arts. And, um, and one of his, uh, one of the artists that he was cultivating and supporting was Sofa Bai. Sofa mm. Bai was sitting there. Um, in the front room and in the back room, uh, there was another person who was living in that house at that time, and his name was Tariq Masood. Uh, so I didn't really know that. I just knew that Sofa Bai was there and that I had to come for tea that afternoon. And um, and it was in July of 1987. And, um, and, and when I get there, of course, there was a collection of people sitting around uh, in the screened, you know, sort of veranda part of the house and um and so Favai introduced me to Tarek and he said you must you must meet Tarek you know he's making a film about a very famous painter you know um, Sultan yes, yeah. Sultan, Sultan mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and so um and Tarek was ready uh because Tarek had been told by so Favai, look I'm I'm inviting an American uh woman over a young woman uh, today and she may have lots of money and you should uh, definitely talk about uh, your film with her because maybe she can help you with it. Uh, so, <laughs> so Tarek, you know, showed me the brochure that he'd published uh, for the film and and said that he was working on an English version of it. And, uh, you know, we got to talking and I, I mean, we continued to meet over the next several uh, weeks and months because Sofa Bai every day would call me at the end of the workday and invite me to come over uh, in the evening. So I would, I lived in Lalmati at that time. So I just, you know, Manik Mia Abnidia, Shang Shad Bhavanish Abnidia, Mitulidita. And, uh, and then I would, you know, s uh, stay there for several hours and Okane Adda Chultu Gonta Bor Gonta. It was very interesting and I wish I had actually recorded it, you know. Uh, that, yeah. uh, unfortunately, true. I was not mm. so interested in preservation in, in those years, but um, yeah, it, it really is too bad that those conversations were not recorded, but they were very. Um, very interesting, very uh, inspiring, and um, and so Tarek and I got to be good friends also, and that was how that that introduction okay. was. Made. All right, okay. So uh, I think I made the right guess, you know, because I knew that Tarek was struggling to finish his film um, Sultan at that time, and you know, it was quite a long drawn project. Uh, so, but after meeting you in '87, he rather finished it rather quickly and uh, came to uh, USA at '89 to. Well, it's no accident that he finished it <laughs> so, quickly. Yeah, yeah. So I would like to know that uh, you must have played a role of catalyst, you know, as a positive catalytical role. And you know? what was that role really? You know, what did you do? What was the magic that you, uh, you know, have it done? So it was no magic. Mm -hmm. um, it was mm -hmm. a lot of work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was a lot of work. Okay. So, um, well, I'd also met Sultan at that time and uh, Sultan okay. Bai, and, mm -hmm. I, and I was introduced to his paintings. Uh, Sofa Bai took me to, mm. you know, see his work um, at the house of Abu Kailitu. Um, and uh, so I was very inspired, you know, mm -hmm. by by uh, Sultan Bai. Sultan Bai invited me to visit him in Narail. Mm -hmm. um, and coming from a painting background myself, you know, it was particularly important. And I, by that time, I'd also started to uh, take up my own work in drawing and painting as well in Bangladesh. So it was already kind of percolating, you know, the artist in me was percolating. And um, and th then when I, you know, met Tarek um, and became friends with him, uh, before even we were romantically involved, um, I, you know, was uh, was very interested in the film that he was doing on Sultan, and um, and eventually uh, I became part of the post production. Tarek by that time had been working on the film for five years. Uh, it was stalled because he'd run out of money um, mm -hmm. and steam, and uh, he was very severely depressed about that situation. Um, so, you know, I think emotionally I played a role um, also in inspiring him to take up the work again, but I also became uh, pretty much involved in the actual work of it as well, I should say. First, 
at first Tarek wanted to protect me. She di pite jetto, and you know, o kane she poristiti modde take kaj korte hoto. I mean, of course, it was great that he had access to the facilities. It was supposed to be free uh, for him to do the work there, but actually, you know, on a gush to jite hoto, you know, whiskey bottle ite di e bhabe kintu take kaj korte hoto she avosta modde. Um, he didn't want me to go there. He said, you know, I'll see you then. And one day I was like, I'm really curious. I want to see what you're doing. You know, what is this about? <laughs> and so he took me with him and I walked into the editing room and it was just full of pieces of film hanging from the walls, you know, all over the tables on the floor. Um, and there was this machine, the editing machine. It's, uh, you know, a flatbed machine, as they call it, or a Steenbeck, uh, with these rotating pans um, where your audio uh, magnetic tracks run in parallel to a visual track, which is the actual mm -hmm. film. And I was fascinated. I was I was hooked. I was hooked from that day. As I, as I told and, you, you had a special knack for all this technology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I <laughs> sat behind the editor. His name was Nusrul Islam, and he'd never had any formal training in film. He was a cutter, you know, mm -hmm. as they say. Mm -hmm. As they say. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. cutters don't get much respect um, in that in Bangladesh, uh, in that part of the world. I think um, at least it, in the government, you know, labs. But he was quite proficient at what he did, and I watched his every move. And um, I figured out, you know, how it worked. And when he fell ill, uh, he had severe kidney disease um, or liver disease, I think, um, and he couldn't work. Then Tarek was, you know, up in arms. What are we going to do? You know, we have to finish mm -hmm. uh, this film. And I said, well, I think I, I, I can do. run the machine. All right. Okay. <laughs> so that's so I story. sat down and I started like doing the work, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I, I can't really say I edited the film. I, it definitely in Israel Islam gets credit for that. But there was a lot of work to be done mm -hmm. in terms of synchronizing the tracks, mm -hmm. um, the fine cutting um, and, you know, then uh, uh, the negatives, you know, had to be cut. So it's kind of overseeing that. And then we had to take all of the materials to India for the final post-production of the lab because there's no mm -hmm. decent lab facility in Bangladesh, uh, particularly for 16 millimeter. And uh, so Tarek and I uh, went together with all of the film materials. And when we got to the lab in Madras, they said, we're going to have to recut your negatives uh, because uh, the joints are like explosions. You know, one shot is overlapping another. <laughs> and so we had to cut, have all the negatives recut. And then we had to resync all of the audio. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was just one thing. I mean, it took months. Okay. It took us three months to finish the film mm. work in uh, India, including also the sound mixing in Kolkata. Um, and before that, we'd also had some final shooting in Bangladesh and I helped to animate a title sequence. And, you know, so it was it was fun, <laughs> but it was really hard week <laughs> right. work. And I'll have to say mm -hmm. that financially also, in the end, Sofavai was right <laughs> because uh, almost the entire India phase of the uh -huh. post-production was okay. financed by me uh -huh. uh, from what was left of my college fund. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, be that as it may. Mm -hmm. I should also add, though, that before mm -hmm. Sultan was finished, um, mm -hmm. you know, I had met Tarek, we'd fallen in love. I'd come back to the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, for about eight months or so. And then I, I came back again to Bangladesh um, to attend the first... Um, Bangladesh Short Film Festival, organized by the Short Film Forum in 1988 or? It was in 1988, yes. 88, yes and I, uh, and mm -hmm. I brought a package of films of Robert Flaherty's. I brought Nanug of the North and Louisiana Story for that festival. I had directly connected Flaherty's family here in the U.S., his daughter who lived in New Hampshire, and she uh, arranged the prints for me uh, from the oh. Museum of Modern Art. And I also brought a package of films that had been made by the revolutionaries in El Salvador, the FN, FMLN, and I brought those to the festival as well. So, mm -hmm. uh, and these were films that had been, you know, as, had been, as, how do we say, secretly um, taken out of El Salvador. So, uh, you know, at that time, the revolution was raging. Uh, so, uh, but the short film festival itself was 
uh, an incredible experience uh, to witness that. And I mm. would say that really sealed my, mm. you know, dedication to cinema, cinema in Bangladesh. Okay. Just to, to understand the kind of impact it could potentially mm. have. And mm. Alamgir Kabir was the chairman of the festival, you know, right, and then right. died uh, just one month after the festival had concluded. So it was a very dramatic time, that whole period. Exactly. And it changed the whole course of, you know, uh, modern Bangladeshi film, as you call it, parallel film. You have written articles on it later. We'll, we'll come back to it. But at 89, I guess you, uh, both of you moved to USA, New York, and we arranged the first uh, show in uh, New York, New School for Social Research. Our friend Salimullah Khan was studying there, and Nasr Ali Maun was there. So we, we did the first screening of uh, Adam Surat in uh, uh, the New School for Social Research. And after that, began another exciting and rather quite unexpected phase of her cinema life, that phase of Muktir Gan, you know, that's a very dramatic. So tell us uh, about uh, the process of discovery. How did you actually, you know, discover this so much footages uh, shot okay. by Leah Levin uh, during the uh, Liberation War in 1971? And uh, the process which followed it, uh, that this very arduous project, which I, I you know, witnessed myself, to bring out a story from it within a whole uh, real uh, story behind it. And you came back to Bangladesh, screened it, and it created an uproar. It started the whole uh, cinematic scene, whole political scene. And it, it, it actually brought about a change in our democratic process also. At least in terms of the spirit of liberation war, the rejuvenation of liberation war, uh, it happened to that film. So this is another very significant, important phase of life. So maybe you can you know, spend some time sharing that experience with our viewers and listeners now. Well, yes, as long as you said, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but I will say that, um, uh, you know, as onekichu kaktaliyo bhavi hoje, but this mm. is also not an exception to that because um, my brother also had a role to play okay. in the start, and you okay. may not know that story. Okay. Okay. Which is by, by the way, there is a comment in live that Catherine the kuch shundor bangla bolle. So tell her to speak more in bangla. <laughs> so feel free. You can you can shatter your shyness. You know you, you can just switch back and forth in bangla. Imagine what you Imagine what you will go. I'll okay. I'll talk it. Sometimes I'll speak bangla, but it's difficult. Ane kichu mona thake na ki bhabe bolbo ko shabdo bhavar ko bo jai ho kamar. So Amar bhai, my my brother one day he was in Princeton, New Jersey at that time. And uh, he uh, was walking down the street on the campus of Princeton University, and a woman in a sari approached him, and uh, with a tipora ekta moila Bangladeshi, Bangladeshana. He thought maybe she was Indian. You know, he wasn't sure. Anyway, uh -huh. she said, um, "Excuse me, where is the physics department?" And of course, he knew where the physics department was. Yeah. And <laughs> uh, he said, "It's over there." And then he thought, almost as an afterthought, he thought maybe I should ask her where she's from. Maybe she's from Bangladesh, right? And so he asked her where she's from. She said, oh, yes, I'm from Bangladesh with a bit of shyness, right? Um, and he said, well, you know, my brother-in-law is from Bangladesh. And she said, really? Who's your brother-in-law? What's his name? And he said, his name is Tarek Masood. And she said, I know Tarek. And it just happened that this woman was none other than Milia Ali. Ziauddin Tariq Ali's, Ali's wife. Then wife. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was just chance that he was a person she asked mm -hmm. directions mm -hmm. of. And so, oh of course, then this whole conversation started about, wait, okay, mm. when are they coming? Because we lived in New York at that time, and we used to visit my brother regularly in Princeton on the mm. weekend. Mm. So we arranged to have lunch with Tariq Bhai and Miliapa that weekend, the next weekend at their house and um so you know Tarek's uh first cousin um uh Benu uh Benu Bhai was a very close friend of Tarek Bhai's so there was much to talk about and Tarek had grown you know up his youth was spent in a in a house in Mog Bazaar where Tarek Bhai and all of the other you know friends of Benu Bhai yeah uh from you know that time uh during the war and uh 
in Mukti Shankar Mishilpi songs da you know uh, that doll she shongskiti doll it shodeshara tarashtu. So you know they were in very close contact um, throughout that period, and Tarek knew uh, Tarek Bhai quite well. So we ended up spending a long lunch with uh, Tarek Ali, talking about all kinds of things. And at one point, just you know out of the blue, Tarek Bhai said, "You know what? There's this uh, fellow." who took some pictures of us in 1971. His name's Lear Levin. And I haven't heard, you know, seen him for years and years. That was in 1990 that we were having this lunch mm, with Tariq. 20 years. There. And he said, mm. you know, I haven't seen him in 15 years or so, but uh, he may still be alive and he may still be in New York. You should look him up. You know, maybe uh, he has some interesting stories to tell and maybe he can show you some of the um, stuff that he shot, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, in Tarek Bhai's view, it wasn't really that much. It was a little bit, you know, but he'd never heard of the film or what had happened to it. So that's when we decided that we would, uh, you know, see if we could find Lear Levin. And there was no internet in those days. There was just a phone book. And we opened the phone book, uh, you know, uh, like the following Saturday. And we're looking through it and there are pages and pages of Levin because it's, you know, it's a a very uh, common last name. Mm -hmm. Last name. Mm -hmm. And um, finally they, uh, finally we found a Lear Levin and Lear Levin Productions. We're like, this must be it. There was only one Lear Levin. There were many thousands of Levins, but only one Lear Levin. So we called him. We just made a, a, a cold call and, and Tarek wanted me to do it and I wanted him to do it. Finally, I said, no, Tarek, you do it. I just can't. I just can't. <laughs> I was really too embarrassed about it. And so Tarek uh, uh, called and it was Saturday. We didn't think anybody would be there, you know, and uh, we called the office, the 11 Productions, and um, a man picks up the phone. Hello. And Tarek uh, said, hello, um, I'm uh, uh, looking for a Mr. Lear Levin speaking. Oh, uh, well, my name is Tariq Masood. I'm a filmmaker from Bangladesh, and my first cousin was uh, Benu, Benu. Uh, Rahman Benu. Uh, you may know him, uh, and uh, you, you may have met him in 1971. He said, yes, I did, and I was there in 1971. And so uh, Tariq said, well, I, I would like uh, you know to meet you since I'm a filmmaker. I'm very interested in the work that you did at that time. And he said famously, I've been waiting 20 years for this phone call. That's what Leo Levin said. Wow. And so then we went to meet him, um, you know, shortly thereafter. And it turned out that there were boxes and boxes of material, all labeled Bangladesh in his basement. Um, and, uh, you know, it was not an easy process, but we had to win Leo Levin's trust. We had to get a whole legal document put together. Uh, you know, because it had to do with rights assignment and um, Lear did not want to be responsible for anything that was said in the film that we were making because Mm -hmm. we had complete creative freedom to make our own story um, just using, you know, his footage. Uh, So, you know, all of that was clarified in this. Um, And uh, and then we started work on it in 1991. And then it was four and it was four and a half years, really, Mm -hmm. that it took us. We finally released the film in December of 1995. um, And most of that film was made in uh, our little wooden house in Staten Island, New York. Uh, So we had no idea what was going to happen with it. (laughs) Absolutely no idea. Uh, We were just focusing on getting it done. And it was a very, very painstaking process, as you know, Mm -hmm. Alain. Um, You know, people in Bangladesh were not witness to that. It seemed to them Mm -hmm. that it magically appeared at their doorstep. But actually, it was a huge amount of work and we had to Mm. collect materials not only from Lear Levin but from all over the world to tell the story that we eventually tried to tell through that film um and I think we should I think I think we we should mention about your deed and landlord Jonathan because who actually uh just (laughs) you know permitted the whole house you know at your disposal every room uh, one room is the editing machine one room is all those you know clips another room is this uh, boxes so uh, he was an I outsider, know. and yeah, so that was the thing. And, and I shared that uh, apartment for some time at that during that time, so I know what went actually behind this whole you know, process of making the film. But tell us about uh, the the aftermath of when it was released in Bangladesh and uh, and the kind of reception we received, the experience and the audience response and the whole uh, the political atmosphere uh, concerning 
the film and the liberation movement. So what was your realization and what was your uh, actually reaction to it? Well, you know, again, it was just a bizarre, um, bizarre confluence of circumstance. I mean, uh, Darek and I came back with the film um, in in early, in March or April, I guess, of 1995. Uh, we got the final prints. We brought four, four prints with us. Um, Kota Chiloji Habib Khan, who, mm -hmm, you know, as, uh, mm -hmm. who was a, a Mul Dharaj Chiloji uh, Prodoshok, you know, a commercial uh, producer. Um, he said that he, he wanted to release the film. Uh, but once we got there, uh, he started to get cold feet. You know, we showed him some of the film, and as you know, the film. That, that was the time I think BNP was in, uh, in power. Yes. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, you know, it was. It's not really about party politics per se, but I mean, it was the climate of the times, right? Right. Exactly. Because um, mm -hmm. there was a lot of suppression around the history of the Liberation, liberation War, war. Mm -hmm. and um, it was sort of a you know. Uh, it 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 was leaning more towards Islamic, you know, politics also, um, so that political Islam, more, yeah, precise. political Islam, Islam yeah. exactly, mm -hmm. political Islam, I should say. Um, um, so the non-sectarian, you know, the more tolerant ethos of the Liberation War was definitely being suppressed, right? That origin story was being suppressed. Um, and this is really what Muktir Gan was about, right? In its in its own way, and I think you know uh, it was it was a very politically charged time. Um, Habib Khan, I think he got nervous about what was going to happen, and we had been counting on him investing money in the release of the film. Um, and you know he said that uh, look, uh, I I could help you with this, but you're not going to get a penny back from it right whatever i do and that was also a, a very discouraging for us because we put so much money into it we had to spend over a hundred thousand dollars to make that film um so we decided that we were just going to release it ourselves and it was an almost impossible task to do that but we had to start in only one venue which was the public library, public library of which is the historic venue mm -hmm. of the short film forum, and you know, be called Podhara Cholichi Choje Andolan, Okani Kintu Stan, who had said Maneta did Cholichi to Prodoshani Ketre, Sheta Shokshonai to Kendro Chilo. So, without any money, um, <laughs> <laughs> we had a team of volunteers. Uh, and we printed our own tickets, printed our own posters, you know, um, begged and, and, you know, grabbed the feet of uh, newspaper publishers to publish free ads yeah. in the newspaper. Um, but I remember that first screening of the film. It was December 1st uh, at the public library. And there were maybe 30 people in the audience, right? And it was very discouraging. But the one thing that happened was that after the film was over, mm -hmm people started crying uncontrollably oh my god because people just didn't know it had no idea yeah. about it right i mean mm -hmm. uh, there had been a, a little bit of like a here and there about mm -hmm. it but people didn't really know what it was mm -hmm. right and so the next day there were like 100 people and the next day there were like you know 500 people and then it was within oh. four oh. or five days it was out of control i mean it was thousands of people, you know, the lines were going around the block and we had to start having shows, you know, from morning until midnight. Um, it, it was just something that we had never, ever imagined, right? Uh, the way that it took off. It was just word of mouth, really. Mm -hmm. And there was so much demand. People wanted postcards. They wanted T-shirts. They wanted the soundtrack. You know, so we furiously started, you know, doing all of that work, you know, like while we're running these shows, you know, also uh, putting together, you know, a cassette master and then designing the cover and getting that printed and then, you know, printing T-shirts and making all of these postcards from stills. I mean, it was just it, it was a huge explosion uh, that took place. And then there was the media attention. I don't think I slept for months um, <laughs> during that time. <laughs> and simultaneously, uh, you know, the political situation was becoming more and more charged. And the film was becoming a part of that. And this was completely 
unintentional. You know, I mean, we had never had any plan <laughs> for this. Yeah, because the, I, because the election was coming up next year, yeah. So there the was election that, was that, coming up the next year, yeah, and yeah. Um, and so you know, uh, people started coming to us and saying, "We want to show the the film in our cinema hall," you know. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And so we started giving prints. The most difficult one during that time was the Cantonment Cinema Hall came to us. They wanted to show the film. And we were like, okay, we were like, okay, you take the prints. <laughs> and, uh, you know, don't ask for any help from us, <laughs> right? Um, you just run it in your hall. And apparently the shows were absolutely sold out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's when the situation got quite dicey for us. Uh, you know, we had spent a long time with the film in the censor board. It had been stuck for five months. I didn't even mention that. Um, but finally, we were able to get it out almost on a technicality uh, without any cuts. Um, and I don't think the censor board anticipated either what was going to happen with this. But um, mm. after, you know, um, the the huge explosion of interest in the film, uh, the articles that were being written, you know, questioning what is, why have we forgotten this? Why did we never know this? Uh, you know, and that women were so involved that it was, um, you know, it was a secular movement. And, and there were some personal anecdotes also, right? Someone from the audience uh, identified her brother there in, in the refugee camp and started began very emotional there, so yes yes yeah. i mean all of that happened we were filming we started filming the shows you know mm -hmm. and filming mm -hmm. uh what people had to say about the film itself and just documenting it right mm -hmm. not knowing that later on this would become part of another film mm -hmm. um but uh then there was a move um from the home ministry to actually ban the film after its release and uh so that was all very dramatic you know and we knew something was in the works uh because there were a lot of special branch people milling about uh at the public library and um and we were getting threatening you know messages and things like that um and then uh we got word that there was somebody had leaked a mm. letter that had been issued by the home ministry banning the film it turned out later to have been an additional secretary who had done that and so we had to lie low, you know, while mm -hmm. that whole thing blew up because it was leaked. The letter was leaked to Bor Kagoj mm -hmm. and Bor Kagoj made a headline of it the next day. Koyajun Muntri Totpor. Yeah. Muktilgan ban Koyajun. I can't remember the exact, he exact headline. And the Bor Kagoj, Bore, but you can do Churi Korenegetse, show up distribution point, okay? so that it couldn't be distributed. Yeah. Um, although uh, uh, mm -hmm. all of the copies were grabbed um, by these unmarked vans. You know, they mm -hmm. came to all the distribution centers and grabbed all the copies of Borak Akagos. All the other newspapers carried a headline. Mm -hmm. about the border cargoes mm -hmm. having been grabbed and about the conspiracy yes. to ban the film, the mm -hmm. Shora Jantru. And, um, and then we never got the letter. <laughs> and, yeah, no, there, there, are, there are lots of stories endless like stories. this. I'm yeah, sorry, yeah, Alam, you, you endless could, stories. Yeah, you could make another two or three films out of it. And uh, actually after that, you moved around the country on your own and showed the films in many different places. And that was another experience and which gave ideas to make your next film Muktir Katha, Narir Katha and all those, but we are going to skip it for now. And, yeah. um, <laughs> and but I would request you to write a book on this though, really. I think it's long. Yeah, and long, I should also add Alam. Yeah. I should also uh, add Alam that, um, that actually I, they tried to throw me out of the country during that time. <laughs> Oh my God. Okay. So yeah. next, next, I think I, uh, we'll uh, touch upon this Matir Moin, another great breakthrough, not just for you, for a Bangladeshi cinema in the, the world, you know, cinema uh, scene. So uh, it was uh, released in Cannes Film Festival. It was uh, awarded with a quite a prestigious uh, prize. Uh, so please share us, uh, share with us your joy and excitement of that very proud moment, which, which also made us proud. I remember that uh, after a couple of years, maybe uh, in Montreal, I was living in Montreal then, it was invited in the Montreal uh, World Film Festival, you were there, it was released in a, a commercial hall and we all went there next day to watch the movie, so it was a great, unforgettable experience for us also. Please share uh, that part of the story of Martin Moina, the making of it and the uh, 
Uh, well, Madhumana making mm. it was very humble again. Mm -hmm. You know, all of these things have very humble beginnings, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was a conversation Tarek and I had in Staten Island that, you know, one day it would be nice to make a film uh, that was based on his childhood because mm -hmm. I always thought he had a really exceptionally um, unusual childhood experience having been sent off to madrasa by his father and having been liberated from the madrasa during the liberation war um so you know we had talked about it on and off over the years and then we decided after muktir gan and muktir kota that we would give it a shot and so we started working on um the script for that and um and we were very lucky uh actually we had been approached by the french embassy to apply for a fund called the south fund a very prestigious fund for international cinema and um so we took it very seriously and we started working on the screenplay for that and then we eventually not only got the south fund um award but we also were able to get a very famous french distributor um as our co-producing partner and distributor mk2 um and uh so, you know, all of this just snowballed uh, um, as we were planning the film. It's, it really started to take off. And, and then in 2001, we started filming it. And um, it, was, it was a very difficult shoot because it's a seasonal film and it's a period uh, film. So we had to shoot over a long span of time. Mm -hmm. You know, Bosha uh, Shamoy, Onik Drisho Ase. Um, and Shite Shumoy o Kwasha Drisho Ase, Jetadi Chobi de Shulhoi, as well as, you know, other seasons, Gram Banglai Jesho Drisho Ase Chobita, Chobite, um, and then the Noka Bais and so on. So there was a lot of, you know, very naturalistic scenery um, in the film that was very demanding to try to capture. Uh, but also all of the period details. So it took a tremendous amount of time and effort um, to get the shooting completed. And, and then, um, you know, we finished, we were finishing the film, we were doing the editing of the film when September 11th happened, yeah. right? And uh, mm -hmm. I remember I was I was in the our editing room in our office when I got news that a plane had hit one of the, t the Twin Towers. And um, you know, incidentally, our roommate from Staten Island, who you might have met, Greg, he was killed in um, in the September 11th attacks. Um, but we didn't know that at the time. Anyway, that really changed the scenario for the film also. I mean, we hadn't planned, you know, on um, that kind of global attention um, on, you know, a film that dealt with something so specific as the, you know, the world okay, of madrasas mm. in in you know and also the film in some ways it tries to parse out the different strands of islam you know mm -hmm. political islam you know versus mm. um sort of the popular islam right yes. and and then, and then there was that wonderful scene of bahas right With the and the bahas and marafuti yes. islam mm -hmm. and you know so all, all of these, you know, different aspects. Uh, and then, of course, woven into the story is, you know, Boati Gan, you know, and, um, and, and sort of, you know, Baul, Baul sort of, uh, spirit. Shang yeah. and mm -hmm. so on. Um, and uh, because I think of September 11th, there was a lot more global interest in a film on this topic because people wanted to understand Right. And here was a film that actually painted a much more nuanced yeah. and in many ways positive also picture yeah. of, um, you know, is a, a predominantly Muslim society. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think, you know, the film really was able to achieve a global audience that way, but it was not intentional. We never did it. We no, never no, made the film yeah, with that yeah. in mind. Right. Um, you know, there've been certain critiques in Bangladesh that, oh, you know, they made it for a Bided audience. No, it wasn't that. We actually made it for a Bangladeshi audience. That's and, why and, I did and, and, and it was a quite an old project of Tarek. Tarek used to say, all, all the time he used to mention that I need to you know, yes. bring that phase of my life, that Madrasha period into cinema in some form or other. So he has been yes. harboring this dream for a long time back. So. Yeah. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, it was quite a surprise uh, when it was picked up and you know it was the opening film of the director's fortnight at Cannes, and then it won an award there and then it you know went to many other festivals and 
you know, uh, won other awards as well. And um, but you know, in Bangladesh, we were not able to show it because it was banned, mm, right? Yeah, and we got the news them. that it was banned while we were in Bangladesh. I mean, while we were at Khan. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have any crew of news photographers from Bangladesh with us in Khan. I should add, we were there on our own, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, people didn't really know what was going on there at the festival when it was going on. But we got the news while we were there that the film had been banned in Bangladesh. And then, of course, all the news organizations, the BBC and in you know, New York Times and all the, you know, they wanted us to play that up that it was banned. But we were like, no, listen, we have to deal with this. We have to go back mm -hmm. and we have to fight this, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. so uh, we have to be diplomatic about it. I mean, so that was also a complication, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just with, as with Muktir Gan, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 these things just suddenly happen and, mm -hmm. and you have to deal with them. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, then when we came back to Bangladesh, you know, Darek, uh, particularly at the fourth took the forefront of working on getting it unbanned and we were able to finally do so but unfortunately mm -hmm. there was a big delay mm -hmm. for audiences in Bangladesh to see the film and we had had a plan actually to make a nationwide release of the film mm -hmm. we'd already been in touch with these distributors in different halls in Chittagong and Sillet and other places um, and then uh, just a few weeks before that was to happen there was a series of bombings of cinema halls around the country. Yes, yes. They have been coincidence. Yeah, the yes. serial bombing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, it yeah, may yeah, have been yeah. coincidence. Dinashpur, Maimon Singh and different halls. Maimon Singh uh, and all these places. Yes, yeah, yes. I mean, and, and it was very tragic. It was horrific. Um, and I think, you know, it was, that was one of the thoughts behind our film Runway that happened. Runway, later, yeah, there right? was a scene of Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. at that time, you know, it was devastating for us. But finally, we were able to release it again in a very limited way. But mm -hmm. um, but it still, ha you know, had a, a, tr a tremendous audience response in Bangladesh. And a lot of madrasa mm -hmm. students, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. and then they, we would talk with them afterwards. And they would they were just so excited. And they said, yeah, I could feel, you know, the, the madrasa in the film, the smell of the madrasa. It was there on the screen. Um, so, you know, it was it, it, it was a very diverse audience. Um, and then Tariq uh, uh, took it on the road and showed it, you know, uh, in some places as well. But it was a very risky situation at that time. We okay. could not do it mm -hmm. to the extent that we would have wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, I, so... I, I, I was about to bring up the uh, issue of uh, runway that it was in a way it was a precursor to that because this uh, this bombing thing of cinema hall was literally shown in that film, Runaway. So yes. uh, it was kind of a prophetic film, you know, that the issue have dealt with this, uh, the extremist, uh, you know, Islamic extremists, the political Islam and those, you know, which turned out to be very true. And late, later on in Bangladesh, as you call it, Jungi Islam, and we have seen Holy Artisan and other phenomena. So uh, what actually made you to you know, foresee this scene in your film and uh, take the risk, you know, is it something that you wanted to uh, dispel the notion? You wanted to discourage the upcoming uh, uh, of this phenomena or the youth, you know, the, the showing the danger, the, the 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 imminent danger of this kind of uh, interpretation of Islam? Well, we had been so feeling it, it for yeah. some time. Mm -hmm. I mean, Alam, we had been feeling it for some time. You mm -hmm. know, we had uh, we had felt under threat. You know, from uh, the time of Matir Moina. Um, mm. uh, Yes, I'm on. <laughs> there, there, there is a, there is a cyclone uh, warning in Catherine's place, so she has to deal with that also. Please pardon this. You know, maybe she has to be distracted once in a while in between the conversation. But okay, carry on, yeah, uh, uh, Catherine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free if you need yeah. to go out and you know give them some candle or whatever you know emergency supply yeah. you know I understand you know the, the situation I know. there. Yeah. Mm. The body cyclone has to say. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, where was I? I? I mean, it is something that we had been yeah, uh, away. Much yeah. aware of it for some time, and I think you know Tarek with his sensibilities, with his background, could also mm. understand you know the thinking, the thought process behind it. I mean, he had a very deep insight into that world, uh, having you know gone through seven years of 
a madrasa and that's education that. and a Kaumi madrasa at that. Mm. Uh, I'm not to, not to say that, you know, Kaumi madrasas are hotbeds of, you know, radical Islam, uh, you know, not at all. Mostly they're not, but mm. there is a, there is an element um, also. And the a world had become increasingly divided, right, after September 11th and the wars in Afghanistan. And uh, so definitely in that climate, Matra Moina, um, you know, we felt, um, we felt the rise of political Islam in Bangladesh as well. And with the bombing of the cinema halls, um, we had become quite, you know, sensitized. Um, and so we had been thinking for some time about addressing this, um, you know, the contemporary situation. Matir Moina looks at it, you know, through the lens of 71 uh, and the years leading up to that. But we wanted to look at a more, through a more contemporary lens. Atecho, uh, I guess um, Runway was a 2009 film, um, uh, sorry, 2010, uh, but we were talking about a period that was roughly around the early 2000s in the story. Um, and we had also, you know, the setting was very important uh, for us, for that film. And we had lived in Uttara for many years and um, had have yeah. happened upon this, Airport. place which is the end of the runway it was a surreal mm. surreal kind of uh situation there where these massive you know planes 747s were taking off and landing against this backdrop of mm. you know kind of uh gram bangla you know almost uh, mm -hmm. at that time and sort of you know shanties on the runway uh and people selling you know peanuts and uh candy right mm. at 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 the fence Mm -hmm. right at the end of the runway right uh, people the cows are grazing you know next to the runway runway mm -hmm. guidelines so you know this was also kind of a, a bizarre setting the clash in a sense between you know east and west uh visually expressed also through the imagery um as kind of part of that underlying analysis analysis of the film about the rise of islam uh a political islam i should say um so um, so that's how the project kind of started through a series of conversations and observations and, um, and it was a different time. It was a different time. Uh, we were not so much under threat personally. And so we had enough space in which to make that film. I should add here, though, that all of these projects, you know, Onto Jatra, Runway, smaller projects like Nora Shundor, um, these were all happening sort of um as interim projects because our plan was to make the sequel to Kagod, Matir Moina, Kagod 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 the so every year. time we would make a film you know like runway or onto jatra or some other project we're like well i think i say apototo etakuri was a grand project right you know he it is involved in the two three different countries period piece and you have done a lot of research i remember you know so already by the time runway already passed smaller project like okay. runway Amarkulam. Okay. and i should also add here alam that this was a time when we were having more and more collaboration again with mishuk munir right yes. because yes. um uh, mishuk was very interested to continue doing cinematography work even though he was based in toronto and so he would come back for visits to Bangladesh and he mm. would say, I'm coming at this time. Let's do something together. Mm -hmm. So it was in this way that we did in Nora Shundar, for example, uh, and then Runway also mm. um, because he was visiting and he planned to come back and settle again permanently right. in Dhaka. And then Amadir planned Shiloje ex Shonge Amra Kagaju Fulakach to Kobo. He did come back finally, you know, that next year. And, and he, he did. Uh, he did. He did. He did. He did. And, uh, Yes, and you, um, you started this project of my Kagu and we started the project. Full swing, you, know, you were uh, went for the and and, look and, at... Mishuk, mm -hmm. and Mishuk and Mishuk did go to the shop for co. I mean, Adam Surat taking me shoot for it. That's of course, you know, Tarek's beginning is working with Mishuk, mm -hmm. but then also I'm at the poor of what the gods, uh, don't um, a kind of childhood on the show, show with gods, 
আমাদের মুক্তির কথা কাজ এমনকি মুক্তির গানের কিছু প্যাচ শুটিং মিশুকো করেছে সেই রাতের যে ফাইট সিনটা ফেক <laughs> that fateful day you know happened and we lost both of them tarik and yes. mishuk uh, including three others i don't know if you're interested to you know say something about that particular day if not let us just go on to the update of kagujit full what is the plan with kagujit full is it going to ever happen uh, what are the challenges how can you think of a solution to it but we'd like to really very much uh, hear something about your feeling Uh, and your experience on that down the road beside them if we can if we can share well i mean you can never predict these things right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, life is full of um of mysteries and sudden shifts and i can only say that at that moment that it happened at that moment i knew that my my life my direction of my life uh was completely changed right it it was completely changed and it, it it would change me also uh irrevocably uh that experience um so it's very hard to recover from something like that and i actually suffered from ptsd uh for many years i was able to get some very good treatment here in the united states uh because i had been you know tarek of course is my life partner we just had a child together um but also we were creative partners and um and mishuk was very much a part of that team and so i lost the two creative partnerships that were most important in the work that we were doing together uh in that moment but not only that you know i also lost three other um close colleagues uh you know um our car was destroyed um i was physically injured i had damage to my eyes i had to undergo for uh operations on my eyes um uh, and our, our friend Dhaliel Mamun the artist Dhaliel Mamun has been battling Dhaliel Mamun mm-hmm. was uh, was almost died um and you know uh Jolly his his wife was also injured um it was a devastating impact you know both physically and emotionally uh, but you know even then people did not want to understand that they did not want to understand what it was like to have gone through an experience like that the media the press um hounded me mm-hmm. when are you going to make this film when are you going to make this film mm-hmm. um i was under pressure from all quarters that i had to continue and yet i had to first of all i had to mm-hmm. um digest i had to support my child i was now a single parent mm-hmm. uh he was only 1 years old um i had all of my colleagues were shell shocked I had to help them get through it. Um Tarek's family need a lot of support. Um I had no money. Um I had no place to live uh because I could not go back to my apartment. Within hours of the crash having taken place, the media was swarming through my apartment taking pictures of my bedroom and my child. I mean it was um I wasn't there. I mm-hmm. I couldn't go back to my house because I was in the hospital. Yes. Um mm. so it was absolutely brutal. It was absolutely brutal. Um and uh, you know I ha- I I must say I had a lot of anger also about that situation. But I should also say that I re- received a tremendous amount of support also from uh you know mm-hmm. friends and 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 people i didn't even know i mean they wanted to help me they wanted to um you know in one way or another they wanted to um make it easier for me uh and so that was also very important to have that kind of support my mother and brother flew over from the united states they were there the next day um and you know then for the next 3 4 years i stayed on in bangladesh right I mean people told me you know it would have been fine if you just checked yourself into a mental hospital for the rest of your life <laughs> we would have understand yeah. 
I understood, yeah. but um, I stayed on for four years uh, until 2015 and continued to work. Mm. And, and I, un unbelievably, you have actually you know, pulled together all your energy and all your courage to uh, do a memorial meeting on Tarek uh, just 10 days, maybe uh, 10 or 12 days after in British Council. I, I, I was there, you know, and it was a, it was a great, great uh, occasion of uh, expressing our tributes and love for Tarek. And after that, you have uh, built an organization called Tarek Masood Memorial Trust uh, single-handedly, and it's quite an active uh, organization. It has uh, built a memorial sculpture uh, uh, as a as a monument against this, you know, the road accidents uh, as a as a rem reminder for the road safety. And you have done uh, some uh, memorial lectures, some uh, also workshops. books. We have brought books out. We have the, brought out books so and books. Tell us, and I should tell, us, say. tell us, tell us about your activities with this uh, memorial books. trust. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. So we brought out a number of books after Tarek died. Uh, the mm -hmm. first. Uh, one um, was a, a called Chalachi Chajatra, a collection of his writings on cinema. And we are just bringing out a new version of this, a new mm -hmm. Newton Shongshkaron uh, Akon uh, Birutse, mm -hmm. um, with some new additions also, new writings that hadn't been included in the first. So it's actually really almost a new mm -hmm. book uh, in a way. And then we brought out um, uh, Chalachi Chalaka, which was a collection of scripts mm -hmm. and songs. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that wonderful album that uh, the memorial oh yes i don't have that with initiative. me yes that was also very that was based on the memorial program yes mm -hmm. uh tarek masu jibono shopno mm -hmm. and then uh, uh chola chicho kota came out in uh uh 2019 mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. that, i don't know if you have a copy of this but this is actually tarek's uh boktita uh, or shatkat character collection mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so i mean uh, the idea is that no, no, you know tarek no, but... You have, you have taken up other projects also you know, to keep his memory alive, keep his work going, and keep his dream, you know, implemented. Yes. Uh, so tell us well, about and, those uh, projects, like uh, the like this uh, the festival, uh, film festival, some workshops. Yes, we had the Tarek yeah, Masood scholarship Utshob. also. Yeah. Scholarship. Yes, yeah. Tarek Masood Utshob, and then um, uh, the uh, the Sholpador Go, and uh, Newton near Mata de Jano Acta Proti Jogita, Chodichito Proti Jogita. We had that for several years running. I mean, particularly when I was there, it was easier mm. to do those things. Mm -hmm. uh, that continued through 2015. Um, and uh, then uh, we had photo exhibitions and um, book launchings and film launchings. Actually, we did do a number of productions. Uh, smaller productions uh, while I was working on, you know, trying to get Kagoshir Fool off the ground again. Um, but uh, we um, produced a, a, a documentary on Tarek. Um, we also Pe finished some. Pera, I think by Pera, yes, by Prashun Rahman. Pera, yeah, yes, yeah, by yeah, Prashun Rahman. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then uh, Kanar Hat Bazaar, a uh, uh, music video that we had shot wow. in 2009, mm -hmm. um, I believe. Um, uh, we finished that and launched that and a number of other uh we brought out some dvd sets of adam suru that is wonderful he brought out all the dvds of the mm -hmm. films that hadn't been because there was tremendous pressure to do this so mm -hmm. you know we made a film about the making uh of Sriti Kota runway about the making of runway mm -hmm. uh, we launched that as well we brought out dvds of muktir gan muktir kota um adam, uh, surat. Mm -hmm. adam surat was a mm -hmm. huge project mm -hmm. um and runway DVD. So all of these we had to bring out, you know, for the public. Uh, it was very important. So between the books and the DVDs and the festivals and the film competitions and the screenings all over the country for the first one or two years, also screenings countrywide um, mm -hmm. in to mem memorialize Tarek, which we ran from the office, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Memorial Trust office. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I didn't sleep for four years, you know, yeah, yeah, afterwards. Yeah. Uh, I think we should thank <laughs> our young activists from Belatus and Mamun also of the movie and Film Society. Yes, Muriana has been very <laughs> active, very active uh, uh, mm -hmm. and, and Proshun. I mean, there's still a very active team, you know, around mm -hmm. this. Working around it, yeah, yeah. Working on this, mm -hmm. and particularly on the new version of Chola Chito Jatra, you know, mm -hmm. Balaito Samun and mm -hmm. uh, Proshun Rahman and Nahid Masood have been very mm -hmm. uh, Rather, instrumental yeah. as an yeah. e editorial team in that. And mm -hmm. also, you know, Muriana Film, Film Society continuing with TMMT to hold the uh Shar Shar book Dita mm -hmm. every year so you know um yeah. uh, all of these things have been really really important yeah. 
to keep, I think, the memory of Tarek alive, but also to keep him alive in a way, because yeah. he had so much to say. Mm. He wasn't just a filmmaker. He was a thinker. He was mm. um, he was an activist, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. He worked for film policy. That was another thing that we did. We worked Yeah, you have, you have done policy. extensive research on the film policy of Bangladesh and a road to reform. But also, you know, yeah. also like activist you about, pressurization yeah. on the and government and the save, the save the cinema hall movement also. Yes. You know, that's another one you've done. But uh, in 2015, you finally came back to USA and embarked on a different life, uh, professional life, to be honest, but that's also associated with film. You are, you've been teaching cinema in universities and designing courses, uh, documentary based in documentary, human rights and other activism, but always uh, grounded in the reality of Bangladesh uh, and your, uh, you know, hope of helping third world nations, uh, developing countries and disseminating progressive ideas through this film. Uh, archiving uh, Armenian uh, genocide, archiving footages and all those. So tell us um, about this phase of your life, starting from like 2015, you have done that uh, film studies in Vermont, you have taken up this job and have been doing all, all kinds of activism through documentary films. So uh, share some um, experience. Well, it's a very, life. it's a different life. It's mm -hmm. a very different life, um, Alam, than I mm -hmm. thought that I would be living. I mean, uh if the accident if the crash i should say we don't use the word accident now um hadn't happened then i would still be in bangladesh you know um and who knows what we would have done in these last 10 years but um but my life was changed forever and eventually i had to come home my father was dying he died in 2016 and then my stepfather uh, was dying. He died in 2018. I had to look after them. My mother is now 86. So I've, I've also had to take on that responsibility. Um, so, you know, eventually it was the family pressure that really made it uh, imperative that I return to uh, the United States. Um, and so when I got here, I had to figure out what I was going to do, <laughs> right? Um, I couldn't just make films. It was too uncertain uh, a future. Uh, so uh, although I had some freelance projects, I decided to go back and get an, a master's in fine arts and MFA. And um, I began uh, teaching at the University of Connecticut while I was getting my degree. And then once I got my degree, I, I got a full time position um, as a, a, a professor there and um, teaching uh, documentary and human rights affiliated with the Human Rights Institute at the university, which is one of the leading institutes in the country, uh, I might add, and um, and doing work that is very much, I think, rooted also in my past ex experience in Bangladesh, you know, that um, is, is definitely folk centered around um, issues of human rights and genocide and um, trauma and loss um, and and social and political conflict. Um, I've been making a film also about my uncle who was a lawyer for the Black Panthers who had to go underground for 13 years uh, because he was on the run from the FBI. Yeah, a, a double so life, a double life you, your thesis film, right? For this uh, master's Yeah, my program. thesis film, mm -hmm. I'm still working on that. But again, mm -hmm. I mean, that, I think that all of that comes out of my experience of Bangladesh and the way in which cinematic storytelling is also tied to um, the storytelling around, uh, you know, national identity and and um, and the the politics and the social movements that define us, right? And that it's really it means nothing unless you're in conversation with the context in which you live. Um, I mean, right now, I'm also working on a project with the Armenian community, you know, there was a, the Armenians suffered a, a genocide in the early part of the 20th century. And many of them actually migrated to the United States after that. And they live with the, the kind of generational memory of genocide, much as, you know, uh, people do in Bangladesh, right? Even if you weren't witness to it, 1971 is part of, you know, national collective memory, right? It's part of the collective conscious and unconscious, so to speak. So, so it is with other communities as well, like the Armenian community. So I'm doing a, a project this semester where we're going to be conducting oral history interviews with members of the community who are subsequent generations of the genocide, but they carry that memory even within them because it's been handed down 
uh, from generation to generation. So I'm really, I feel very privileged and very lucky to be able to do that kind of work that's close to my heart, even if I can't be in Bangladesh now because of the pandemic. Um, I do have um, dreams of coming back to Bangladesh mm -hmm. again and doing mm -hmm. more work there, film work there, you know, whether it's Kago Jarful or yeah. something else. Yeah. But um, you but also you're, you're also virtually connected because just a few weeks back, I think you were part of this uh, Liberation uh, War Museum doc fest. Uh, you were a special guest there, and I met you online there also. I was a jury. Not only that, that. yeah. Also, not only you, that. Many other events. I think you you're, you're associated. Well, with, and right? also yes. recently, mm. uh, recently mm. I was part of uh, the International Genocide Scholars Convention. Um, where I uh, organized a panel actually on um, uh, films on the liberation war mm -hmm. uh, with a focus on our films. Um, and we brought together a, a group of panelists, most of them from Bangladesh, mm -hmm. to talk mm -hmm. about, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, Mukti Judo Cholo Chitro and Mukti Gan and Mukti Kota, Matir Moina. Um, and that was one of the uh, central panels, actually, of this conference. So, you know, I feel very privileged to sort of bring that story mm. that comes out of my own experience mm. and the films that we did, you know, to, mm. to the wider world also. Um, and I hope to continue doing yeah. that. And and you, have also, you have also done that wonderful work of Friends of Bangladesh, like those who has helped us during this liberation yes, the war. Archive. You know, that yes, the archive. The yes. archive thing, you know, that was also a great initiative okay I, I think we are also running out of time and you yes. need to you need to go out and uh, you know prepare for the impending cyclone uh, but i would like <laughs> to touch upon the uh, the cinema of bangladesh uh, which is you know our whole discussion is anchored around that one and yes. while you were in bangladesh you have done many works around it like as we've mentioned that you have done a research on the film policy of bangladesh you have written an article, yes. uh, uh, Escape for Bollywood, on the parallel film of Bangladesh, that, that, that movement of the Spikol for Cinema. You were part of uh, uh, the South Asian Children's Cinema Forum also. You have done uh, an extensive research on that. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, I have seen that the, you have written uh, some paper on women filmmakers of Bangladesh. So you know, based on all these experiences, uh, I'd like to just ask you, what was your findings about the cinema of Bangladesh, uh, the, the ground reality? What was your observation? What was the recommendation? I'm pretty sure that uh, those are still valid. Uh, and the situation uh, didn't improve since then. Uh, most likely, it has worsened. So I'd like to hear from you your observation, your recommendation, your analysis of the overall cinema scene of Bangladesh and the way forward from here. Yeah, well, you know, when I was uh, um, working in Bangladesh after 2011, um, we together, you know, with a group of commercial and independent filmmakers, we were pressurizing the government at that time to come out with a new film policy. Uh, having studied the situation in other parts of South Asia, uh, India and Pakistan particularly, it was clear that Bangladesh was really lagging behind in reforming their policies around film. In particular, there was a very high government tax on cinema halls that was killing, you know, the most important infrastructure of the film industry, which is its exhibition infrastructure. Uh, so we we successfully lobbied the government to abolish that tax, uh, but also, I mean, it was very important to have government investment and incentives for uh, theaters to upgrade their facilities um, with digital projection as, you know, the whole industry was switching over from celluloid to digital. And that's also been accelerated, you know, in recent years now. Um, so um, if some of that did take place uh, and it did help uh, to a certain extent, you know, I wasn't really able to do a follow up study on what kind of positive impact that might have had. But, you know, the, the steamroll of technology is continuing no matter what we do. And it has made it much more possible now to make international standard, you know, uh, productions have those production values with less money in mm -hmm. in a financial investment in equipment uh, i think the main challenge in bangladesh um is the outreach but as we've seen with the recent uh, new bangladeshi film that has gone to the khan film festival which is wonderful news and i think will inspire a whole new generation of filmmakers 
uh, those films you can make now, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there is definitely technical know-how. There is the equipment. Uh, there is the talent to, to make those kinds of films. Uh, the question is, how yeah. do you really release them successfully? That was, that's the real blockade, I think. You know, India has been able to surmount that with a network of, of, of multiplex theaters around the country that mm -hmm. can offer much more diverse um, genres of film that mm -hmm. cater to more, you know, educated, urban, mm -hmm. middle-class audiences Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of trend has been much slower to take place in, in Bangladesh, but that was what we were trying to incentivize, you mm -hmm. know, the establishment of those kind of theaters. You see that in Nepal even, um, and mm -hmm. in Pakistan also, mm -hmm. a much lesser extent in Bangladesh. So Bangladesh has lagged behind in the infrastructure of exhibition. Um, you know, new possibilities are opening up now with streaming, online streaming, but then how do you monetize that mm -hmm. for the producers of cinema? Um, you know, these are these are the challenges now. Um, and then, of course, in the time of a, of a pandemic, uh, having large gatherings of people even to see films is challenging. Mm -hmm. it, that's one other level of, of complexity to it. But I think in terms of the making, I think tremendous strides have been made, you mm -hmm. know, and there needs to be more, um, you know, more. Uh, collaborations, international ca collaborations, right. co-productions, not just with Europe or the United States, but also regionally uh, with countries like Korea that have very developed film industries. We need to really study those examples more and mm -hmm. see, you know, how it was possible, you know, the role that film festivals have played uh, is also really critical. Um, the role that film education has played. I mean, that was another thing that we pushed for in the aftermath of the crash was the establishment of a national film institute, uh, which is which has happened. It started, um, you know, at the initiative of the government and the prime minister. Uh, but the the required infrastructure that you need to really make that viable has not. Um, been fully developed yet. So, um, you know, those are all things that have to work together, yeah, right? It's not right. just the makers and the talent mm -hmm. and the equipment and the know-how uh, mm -hmm. on the production end, but there's also, uh, you know, the educational aspect and there's the exhibition, exhibition aspect. I think, you know, those two legs of that table need to really be developed much further, not in a haphazard fashion where you have a small institute here and there and elsewhere. Mm. Um, you know, now Doc University has, you know, a film and television program. program. That's great. Um, uh, and um, like I said, the Film Institute has been um, established. Pri private universities uh, also started opening yeah, up the film department. You need, more, mm -hmm. you need more educators also who are not just going to go in to the classroom and tell stories about way back when, but they need to have, you know, mm -hmm. real skills, a real toolkit for teaching cinema. Um, I think all of these things need to come together, you know, to take the, um, the industry Bikolpo, ba, uh, you know, Muldara doesn't matter. I don't, I think. I don't um, think we need to do that yet. Yeah, I don't think we need to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it's all been equalized in some way. Uh, rather, Muldara has become sort of Bikolpo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it has been marginalized, you know, the, the, the lack yeah, of yeah. cinema halls, you know, lack of yeah. producers there. They're actually applying for government grants these days, you know, for yeah, the film, which yeah. was actually intended for the Bikolpo Dara only. Okay, go yeah, ahead, continue, yeah. continue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I oh. think, you know, all of, all of those things need to work together, but um, mm -hmm. I, I'm very hopeful. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. very optimistic mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, there's a, a bright future lies ahead. It takes time. It does. I mean, you, you see the experiences of countries like Iran and South mm -hmm. Korea. You know, they started very small and it just sort of snowballed um, mm -hmm. Over the decades, uh, so I think you know Bangladesh can also learn a lot from those examples. Um, but I think that tremendous strides have been made, um, and there are some you know great film organizers, activists who are working. Film festival you know organizers like the Children's Film Festival, I think, has brought a whole new generation of young filmmakers uh, mm -hmm. into that stream um and also, also and one thing i think you have noticed that a lot of young women are coming into film these days a you know, lot of young yeah, women they're making are coming... feature films they're making documentary films they're uh, doing research they're 
writing criticisms, uh, they are promoting films. So there is a whole new force, women force in the cinema scene. And you have, yes, you have, you have written a, a paper on the women filmmakers of Bangladesh. So what is your word of advice or what is your... Uh, I don't think they need the, my advice. Uh, so what, I don't think no, they... Depending on your own experience, the struggle you have done, I think you have learned a lesson. Maybe you want to share your lesson with them uh, before we end. Yeah. Well, again, I don't think, you know, they need my advice. I think they're figuring it out themselves. And, um, you know, sometimes you have to break away from, you know, I, I worked with all male teams practically, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I tried to cultivate, you know, young women under me who were kind of my assistants. Uh, and some of them have gone on to do incredible work, like Elizabeth da Costa now is, yeah, you know, uh, won national and, uh, awards with her it, documentary. It's making Bangla waves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. literally, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, so, you know, but I, th I think that, you know, many young women have realized that they need to form their own teams. They need to, you know, have their own sort of support networks amongst themselves. Um, and I think that's more possible now that there are more of them to mm. work together. Um, mm. I see that, you know, in the United States that um, actually my film uh, is being supported through something uh, called Women Make Movies, which supports women filmmakers. Right. So there need to be organizations also that are specifically targeted to supporting women's film that provide grants to films made by women. I think that needs to happen more at this stage. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that the filmmakers themselves have, mm -hmm. have, have are doing tremendous work. Mm -hmm. uh, Rubaiyat Hussain is another, yeah. you know, there are many mm -hmm. in the new and, generation. And, and, and speaking about Rubaiyat, Rubaiyat is actually taking an initiative to encourage young women filmmakers. So she's trying to actually nurture the talents also in this field. Yes, uh, Actively yes. supporting them. You know. Yes, yes. And I, I think, you know, having all women production teams is important Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. because, you know, whether whether you like it or not, I mean, having being in a mixed team with men and women means that the women get undermined. Right. And I face that also, but I'm not going to complain. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, you don't get taken as seriously if, if you're a woman, uh, a woman making a film or directing a film. Um, and so it's it's helpful actually to bring together a team of women in the in the making process. But I think also teams of women need to come together in producing and um, in you know in exhibiting in uh, you know so that the entire stream from production through to exhibition uh, is is supported by a network of women. Um, and you can also find grants uh, internationally that are. <laughs> Uh, are directed towards supporting women filmmakers, um, but you know, I'm, I'm again, I'm very hopeful. Oh, okay. uh, there's been some some okay. great work that's been done in the last ten years, so uh, they don't need my advice. Okay. I think they so we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we will end that on this very optimistic note that you know you're very hopeful, and Bangladeshi cinema will find its place in the world cinema map very soon, and uh, and, and uh, the the symptoms or the indications are quite visible all us around. So we'll take a break right now uh, for a QA session. Uh, although you know, I don't see too many participants in Zoom, but I have received quite a few comments in my in our Facebook Live. So I'll read those out for you. Those are in Bangla. My life partner, you met her in Montreal. Remember, you know? One evening yes. we spent our deed and organization, Sultan Ar Shopno, even Tarek visited, uh, including yes. uh, Tanvir Mukhavadev, wonderful evening. She is here. I don't know if uh, Mahia is interested to say something, to say hello to you. And also, my uh, close associate, uh, Mishuk Ehsan, uh, he's also a filmmaker, but a more a film enthusiast. Right, he's there also. <laughs> Another Mishuk, yeah. So Mahia has uh, turned uh, her uh, video hello, on. Mahia. ভালো থাকবেন আপনি Thank you. I mean, I think I said, I'm going to go to the 
ক্যাপ্টেন কে দমানোর সাধ্য কারণই কারো ক্ষমতা নেই হ্যাঁ আমরা ক্যাপ্টেন এর কাছে ঋণি এবং আরো ঋণ তার কাছ থেকে আমাদের পাওয়ার রয়েছে ওকে थैंक यू মাহিয়া আমি এখন একটু মিশুককে বলবো যে কিছু শেয়ার করার জন্য তার অনুভূতি তার কিছু কমেন্ট যদি থাকে ক্যাপ্টেন এর জন্য বলো মিশু না আসলে কমেন্ট নাই ক্যাপ্টেন মাসুদ কা অনেক ধন্যবাদ সময় দেওয়ার জন্য তার ব্যস্ত সময় থেকে বাংলায় বলছি কোনো অসুবিধা নেই তো না না এখন সমস্যা নাই না আমার দুঃখ লাগছে যে আমি এতক্ষণ ইংরেজি বলে আসছি আমার তো খুব খারাপ লাগছে না না কোনো অসুবিধা তুমি ভালো বাংলা বলতে পারো কিন্তু মানে বলতেই পারতে বাংলা কোনো অসুবিধা নেই যথেষ্ট সুন্দর কাকতালি শব্দরে যে সুন্দর করে ব্যবহার করলে তুমি আচ্ছা মিশু বলো বাংলায় বলো কোনো অসুবিধা নেই ভালোই বুঝতে পারে হ্যাঁ সেটাই মন্ত্রমুগ্ধের মত শুন ছিলাম এই যে মুক্তির গান বানানোর পেছনের ঘটনাটা শুনে খুবই অবাক লাগলো এটা জানা ছিল না জানলাম সে সময়কার অবস্থা সম্পর্কে কিছুটা অবগত হলাম এবং তার যে জার্নিটা এটা মানে আসলে কি বলে এটা বাক্রুদ্ধ হয়ে যাওয়ার মতো মানে কথা হারিয়ে যায় এটা মন্তব্য করাটা আসলে খুবই টাফ বা অনুভূতি ব্যক্ত করাটাও আর হচ্ছে যে অনেক দিনের ইচ্ছা ছিল যে ক্যাপ্টেন মাসুদকে সামনা সামনি দেখার হয়ে ওঠেনি কখনোই আজকে জুমের কারণে দেখা হয়ে গেল খুবই ভালো লাগছে যে তাকে দেখতে পেলাম শেষ পর্যন্ত এটাই আমি আসলে আসলে কথা খুঁজে পাচ্ছি না মানে ওনার মতন একজন মানুষকে কি জিজ্ঞেস করব কি বলবো এটা খুঁজে পাচ্ছি না সেটাই না ঠিক আছে থ্যাংক ইউ থ্যাংক ইউ আমার আমার খুবই ইচ্ছা ছিল বাংলাদেশে এবার যাওয়া হবে আগস্টে যেতে পারিনি কিন্তু আশা করি একদিন আমাদের বেশি দূরে না যে থাকতে পারবো এবং সামনে সামনে পরিচয় হবে মিশুক তোমার সাথে এবং আলামের সাথে আবার দেখা হবে আমার মনে হয় একটু বড় হলে তখন তারও একটা বিশেষ আগ্রহ হবে বাংলাদেশের সম্পর্কে আরো বেশি জানতে এই বয়সে এখনো কম্পিউটার গেমস ছাড়া তেমন কিছু জানে আমি জানি যে আর একটু বয়স হলে তখন তার অনেক সে অনেক অবশ্যই অনেক কিউরিয়াস অনেক কিছু জানতে চাই তার বাবা সম্পর্কে এমনকি সে তার গত বছরে তার তার সোশ্যাল স্টাডিজ ক্লাসে ওখানে একটা প্রেজেন্টেশন করেছে তার বাবার উপরে একটা স্লাইড শো করেছে তার বাবার জীবন অনেক গবেষণা করেছে অনেকগুলো ছবি সংগ্রহ করেছে আমিও হেল্প করেছি তাকে ছেলে কি কাছে আছে এখন ছেলে সাথে নাই মনে হয় সে বাইরে গেছে কোথাও বড় হয়ে গেছে এগারো বছর বয়স চট্টগ্রাম নিয়ে আসবো ক্যাথরিনার মনসি এলে যেমন আমার বাড়িতে গিয়েছিলে মনে আছে বোধ হয় তখন আমার মাও ছিল মা রান্না করে খাইয়েছিল সন্ধ্যার সময় আমরা একসঙ্গে খুব সুন্দর একটা দিয়েছে হ্যাঁ সেটাই আমার মা এখন নেই মা বিদায় নিয়েছে কিন্তু আমরা আছি আমরা আমরা তোমাকে আপ্যায়ন করতে পারবো আশা করি মিশুকরা আছে সবাই আছে তো আমরা শেষ করব শেষ করার আগে আমি লাইভে কিছু মন্তব্য এসে যাচ্ছে তোমাকে পড়ে শোনাই তোমার জানার জন্য আতিকুর রহমান একজন উনি অস্ট্রেলিয়া থেকে দেখছেন উনি লিখছেন যে আজকের আয়োজনটি খুব গুরুত্বপূর্ণ অশেষ ধন্যবাদ প্রিয় আলম খোরশেদ ভাই সাইব শাহিন উনি লিখছেন ভালো লাগছে আতিকুর আরো একটি লিখেছে যে ক্যাথরিন চমৎকার বাংলা বলেন 
তাই বলছি তিনি যদি বাংলা বলতেন আরো হৃদয়গ্রাহী হতো আলমগীর হক স্বপন ইউনো আলমগীর রাইট আলমগীর ফরিদুল হক আওয়ার ফ্রেন্ড একজন সাহসিনী নারী নমস্কার জানালাম আর কি মেরিন নাজনীন বহু অজানা তথ্য জানলাম খুবই ভালো লাগলো আলম খোসেদ স্যারকে আন্তরিক ধন্যবাদ তিনি আবারও লিখেছেন বাংলাদেশের চলচ্চিত্র নির্মাতাদের এই অনুষ্ঠানে আনলে আশা করি ভালো হবে তারা আসি নিয়ে বাট আশা করি লাইভে অনেকেই দেখছেন আমি কয়েকজনের নাম দেখেছি খুব ভালো অনুষ্ঠান হচ্ছে জয় বাংলা জয় বঙ্গবন্ধু তিনি লিখেছেন চাঁদ গাতে বসে এমন আন্তর্জাতিক মানে অনুষ্ঠান দারুণ কায়েস চৌধুরী উনি লিখেছেন শুভেচ্ছা সন্দীপন গাঙ্গুলি কলকাতা থেকে মানে এখানে আছেন আমাদের শিক্ষক এবং বাংলার স্কলার জুয়েল মাজার নাদার গ্রেট পোয়েট এন্ড এডিটার এন্ড ট্রান্সলেটর হিস ওয়াচিং দিস শো শিলু মাহফুজ শিলু মাস্টার আমি তোমার কাছে এটা লাস্ট ফিলিং এন্ড রিয়াকশন চাচ্ছি ইন টার্মস অফ দিস কমেন্টস ইন ফেসবুক লাইভ এন্ড ফাইনালি ক্লোজিং রিমার্ক thank you alhamdulillah i want to say thank you again you know to you and your team for uh, uh in, inviting me here and having this chance to reflect on you know many um incredible experiences in my in my life i feel very privileged to have been able to experience these things and witness these things i i, I mean monogri in nijigekta shaki Mm. Uh, in a sense uh, his, a witness to history right because so many of these things যাত্রা আমরা চোখে দেখতে পারিনি সামনে আমাদের কি ঘুরতে যাবে বাংলাদেশের জাতির গল্পর একটা অংশ হিসাবে থাকতে সেটা সেটার জন্য আমি কৃতজ্ঞ আমি আই গ্রেটফুল ফর দ্যাট এক্সপিরিয়েন্স এন্ড আল বি ফর এভার গ্রেটফুল ফর দ্যাট বাংলাদেশ আমার আমার মধ্যে বাংলাদেশেও একটা বড় অংশ আই রিথেন দ্যাট লাভ অফ দ্য কান্ট্রি অ্যান্ড ইস পিপল ফর এভার রাইট ইট ওয়াজ ইন জাস্ট তারেক রাইট ইট ওয়াজ ওয়েন আই মেরিড তারেক আই মেরিড এন এন্টায়ার কান্ট্রি আই শুড সে সো আই উইল অলওয়েজ বি এ পার্ট অফ দিস কান্ট্রি বাংলাদেশে থাকলে না থাকলে থাকলেও আমি বাংলাদেশে আছি আমার আমার মন বাংলাদেশে রে গেছে ফেলে আসছি ওখানে আগামী দিনে আমাদের কাছে to also think about the present and the future as well. Thank you. Anik, Anik, Dhanubad, Catherine. Shakti, I'm going to give you a few days. I'm going to give you a few days. 
বাংলাদেশের ইতিহাসটাকে আমরা যেন আবার নতুন করে উদযাপন করলাম যাপন করলাম এবং আমি জানি তোমার আরো অনেক কিছু করার আছে অনেক স্বপ্ন তুমি ধারণ করো তারেকের স্বপ্নগুলো আছে তোমার নিজের স্বপ্ন আছে নিজের কাজ আছে গত দশ বছর আমেরিকার নতুন জীবনের ভিতর দিয়ে আরো অনেক নতুন অভিজ্ঞতা সঞ্চয় করেছে অনেক উপলব্ধির জায়গাটা তোমার বিস্তারিত হয়েছে আশা করছি আমরা অদূর ভবিষ্যৎ আবারও দেখা হবে এই বাংলাদেশের মাটিতে তোমার সেই স্বপ্নগুলো নিয়ে তোমার সেই অসমাপ্ত কাজগুলো নিয়ে এবং তোমার সবটুকু ভালোবাসা নিয়ে আমি বিস্তারে পক্ষ থেকে তোমাকে আরো একবার আমাদের অনেক অনেক ধন্যবাদ কৃতজ্ঞতা এবং ভালোবাসা ব্যক্ত করছি তোমার জন্য ভালো থেকো নিশাদকে ভালো রেখো যত্ন নিও এবং তোমার মাকে আমার শ্রদ্ধা জানিও ভাইকেও আলফেটকেও আর কি অনেক অনেক ধন্যবাদ হ্যাঁ এবং এই ঝড়টাকে মোকাবেলা করো আশা করি ঝড়টা বিপজ্জনক হবে না তোমাদের ওই বাড়িতে আমি গেছি সেলেমে যে বাড়ির কথা বলছো বেশ একটা নড়বড়ে এবার দেখে এসছি বাঁচাবে আমাদের সেই গাছের আন্দোলন বৃক্ষরোপণ আন্দোলনে করে যেতে হবে তো তোমার জন্য অনেক অনেক শুভকামনা রইল শুভরাত্রি শুভরাত্রি থ্যাংক ইউ